I'm going to introduce our first candidate, it's uh, uh, Todd Gessley, and he is running on the theme, So Klamath Rises. Uh, he recognizes there are many hurting and discouraged people facing challenges all around us. He always strives to make informed, positive, nonpartisan decisions which aim to unify our communities, give hope to each citizen, and bring a new energy to the region. Todd is a fiscal conservative, constitutionalist, husband, father, and owner of Totally Inspired Media. He loves diversity, hates government corruption. He's an advocate for swift and fair justice, education, health care, and being tough on crime. He earned his BA in mass communications at Walla Walla University with a business minor. He earned his professional project management certification from City University while working for a faith-based nonprofit focused on education, health care, and religious liberty. Todd just passed his Oregon General Contractors Boards at KFCC. He's a grant writer, contract negotiator, marketer, live event producer, and he has board chairman experience. He's been an Oregonian for 42 years. He believes communication and services must improve in remote rural areas. Uh, please help me welcome uh, Todd Kessley. Well, thank you for the introduction. It's good to be here in Klamath Falls. I'm the newest face in the race. Uh, yesterday was my one year anniversary of moving in with COVID and checking into Sky Lakes and surviving it on oxygen for nine days. So um, it's good to be here. Uh, my wife is back in the back front of the camera. Uh, her name is Gianni. We're high school sweethearts. We uh, went to school here in Southern Oregon uh, at Milo Adventist Academy. We have one 15 year old son uh, who's a freshman at KU. And uh, boy, we have just, we love the hiking and the kayaking and and all the wonderful things to do outdoors. We plan to be here for life. We care about this community, and it's been so much fun getting out of these different, different uh, debates and forums and meeting people, especially in the rural areas, and answering all these questions. Some of them will, you know, we'll be able to help you with. But the number one thing I see that's missing is good communication. Um, people in these rural areas and, and physical presence. The other thing is we kind of have an unbalance of, of resources here. A lot of it's right here right here in Klamath Falls, and we need to start looking at how we can benefit and serve the taxpayers in the other outlying areas. This is a huge county, and so we've got some challenges and things we have to look at there. Um, uh, you know, I love love the farmers. I grew up on a, on a little uh, five-acre hobby farm, had sheep and a pony. Um, I've worked in a lumber mill. Uh, I, you know, I've done landscaping. Um, so I, I resonate with the types of people that we have in the valley. I've done a lot of work. I've worked in 42 countries internationally as an international photographer and journalist, and uh, worked on a lot of works with last tribes and regional peoples, documenting their ways of life. So I love the tribal people, and I look forward to helping bridge some of the communication and misunderstandings that we have uh, as in within our community, um, and and as we as we look, deal with these issues of water, which are usually above what the commissioners can do, but we can help communicate. Got one more minute? Wow. Um, <laughs> you don't have to take it. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to slow down and uh, yield the microphone. But hey, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm glad Rotary is here today. And you guys look like you guys have a lot of fun together. So thank you so much. It's good to be here. OK, thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Alan Headley. Born in Orange County in 1955, he worked in dairy, poultry, and agricultural farms to pay his way through Christian boarding schools. He served our community in the United States Army from 1973 until 1976 during Vietnam, and worked at Loma Linda University Hospital in Oncology and ER from 1976 until 1978. Alan graduated from the San Bernardino Sheriff's Reserve Academy in 1985. He enrolled at Antelope Valley College in criminal law to further his criminal law enforcement career. Alan worked for attorneys for four years before receiving his California General Contractor's License in 2006. In 2011, Alan worked in the solar industry for approximately two years before retiring after 23 years in the motion picture industry and relocated to Bonanza, Oregon for the past 12 years. Last year, he was granted his disabled veteran status. Uh, please help me welcome Alan Headley. Thank you everyone for having me here today. I appreciate that and the honor um, to be here to speak with you. Um, my focus is infrastructure, 
law enforcement uh, and last but not least, water. It seems to be an issue that has plagued the community for years, um, going back to 1990 uh, and further from what I've understood and gathered from different farmers. Um, to bring the farmers, solar, infrastructure together, housing, uh, this is the secret ingredient to bring all together to make this happen. Uh, those are my, that's one of my main goals. Uh, also education, as far as uh, trade schools, we seem to have a shortage of general contractors in the area, which we're probably all aware of. Um, bringing the trade schools in with internships to be able to work on some of the buildings here uh, that the county and maybe the state owns. So they can do their internship and possibly go get their general contractor's license and add to the ability to fill spots in the community. So when you need a plumber, you can get a plumber and not have to wait three months, um, like the lady next door to me right now. Um, the time that's spent in this community uh, goes without spoken reasoning. Um, my goal is to bring all the community together. And right now, uh, I've talked to a lot of business people, and they seem to be interested in coming together quarterly or every six months to talk about uh, things that are plaguing the business industry here, and see if we can bring people together to be able to make it a better place for people to live. I want to thank you for this time, and I will now hand this mic over to uh, Mr. Henson. Thank you. So our third candidate today is uh, Dave Hensley. Um, he's married to his wife Benji of 28 years. They have three adult daughters. Dave owns and operates 5-H Cattle Company in Merrill and loves the rural way of life and finds great pride in developing his family brand into a symbol of trust and respect. Dave retired in 2021 as Klamath Falls City Chief of Police after 28 years of community service and public safety. During his law enforcement career, he served nine years as a law enforcement executive responsible for providing vision, developing policy, leading and inspiring employees, meeting the needs of the community, and developing and managing multi-million dollar budgets. Dave has received awards and recognition from political business community leaders for leadership and achievements in providing public safety services, as well as advocating and promoting our community. David is a graduate of Oregon State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science. I'm supposed to be neutral here, so I'm holding back, man. Uh, he is also a graduate of the prestigious FBI National Academy, Oregon Executive Leadership Institute, and completed mid-management police certification at the Mark Hatfield School of Government at Portland State University. Uh, please help me welcome Dave Hensley. Thanks for the introduction and thanks Rotary for letting me uh, be here today and, and uh, speak with all of you. It's so great to see so many friends and neighbors in the audience and people I've worked with over the years. So those that I haven't spoken to since I've retired, it's great to see you again. Um, that was my intro, so nice job, Mr. Kevin, for doing that. You took my three minutes right there. So here's what, I, what I'd like to do. I'd really like to talk with you about why the heck are you running for Klamath County Commissioner, Dave? You've had a successful law enforcement career of 28 years. Um, I left with a great amount of pride from internal pride about the, what I accomplished as your chief, and I know the community supported me when I retired as well, so now I know. A lot of people are asking, why are you jumping from, as my campaign and good friend, my campaign manager and good friend Joe says, why are you jumping from the, from the pan into the fire? So, so here's why. My entire adult life, 28 years I spent in public service, I was extremely proud of that. When I was honored and blessed to, to receive the job as your police chief, I came down to Klamath Falls with, with Benji and we finished raising our children here and we chose Klamath. We were really um, motivated and inspired by many of you and we talked to many of you before we transitioned moving to Klamath and we were really moved and inspired by all the positive energy and people wanted Klamath Falls to be better and to grow and be this really amazing place to live, work and raise our families and we wanted to be a part of that so we came here. Um, Immediately after getting hired as the chief of police, I developed and formed the community police advisory team. And some of you in this room actually sat on that advisory team. 
And I asked you, what do you want from me? What do you want from your police chief? How am I going to help this town be successful? And I listened to you. You wanted a transparent agency. You wanted a professional agency. You wanted an agency that you could trust and respect and rely on. All of these wonderful things. You wanted a, an agency that was community first and all about the community, and we did all of those for you. We became an accredited law enforcement agency. We're the only accredited law enforcement agency in Klamath, in Klamath County. And then we were re-accredited again before I left. We were ranked as one of the top 10 worst places to live in Oregon when I became your chief. And by year four, we're the 15th safest town in Oregon. So I'm really proud of, of the grace you gave me and what we developed in, in a culture of policing in Klamath Falls. When I retired, that was gone. Several of you in this room I haven't seen for a year and I miss that. I feel that my education, my training, and most importantly, my passion for Klamath County, my passion for you, and my experiences translate very well into a Klamath County Commissioner. Joshua Johnson from NBC said in a quote, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote him, he said, it's not my job to tell you what to think, it's my job to think about what you tell me. And I firmly believe that, and I think that's what commissioners need to do. It's time that your voice is back in government, and you have somebody that you can trust and rely on, like me, that's done right by this community with a proven track record, to advance your needs at, at, here at home as well as in Salem and in DC. So God bless and thank you. Well, thanks everybody for staying within your time limits. No fines uh, this, this year. Um, okay, it's, uh, it's that time. Questions? Questions? Jerry? Uh, this is just a specific question you gave. There's been some news about the possibility that you're not supposed to run yeah, that's a great question. I was praying somebody would bring that up. We can't hear it back here. I'll repeat it for him. There's some fake news going around that I may not be eligible to be sworn in as your Klamath County Commissioner because of a constitutional article. Um, number one, the article that they cite is actually incorrect. It's about um, corporations, but the news art or the article that they're actually referring to, and might I add that they be my opponents that are saying negative things about me. Um, that is completely fabricated and inaccurate. Um, Oregon tort law says that when a government entity is sued, even the people that are named in that lawsuit are indemnified by the agency they work for. So I have absolutely zero liability in a pending lawsuit that's been going on for many, many years. I will also say that um, I've done nothing wrong and I'm extremely proud of everything I did as the police chief and I think that you guys are as well, and we're going to be vindicated, and I'm going to be very happy about that, but there is absolutely nothing that precludes me from um, this race, and I've got letters from attorneys to prove that. So thank you for bringing that up. Other questions? Yes, sir. I'll ask one. Yeah, I retired from selling real estate in September, and uh, the issue of housing to me is a really critical issue. Klamath County has 46% home ownership of, of homes here, so that means we have 54% of the people here are in rental properties. And the national average is 72% of home ownership, and we create community through home ownership. So I'd be curious as to what you guys think the commissioners could do, because I believe they have a role to play. And we go over this in Jackson, Josephine County, including here, that the commissioners have kind of, in my opinion, have uh, just to bridge that whole issue of housing and kick it down the road to somebody else. And it is a mess. And it is really acute here. So I'd really like to know what you guys think the commissioners would do if you're elected to try to solve some of the housing issues and help build the community that we need with home ownership. So did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay, um, so this first, uh, this first question, uh, Alan, you get the first crack at it, and then Dave, and then Todd. Uh, that question was asked me in a radio talk show this morning, and uh, the water came up again. And then also permits uh, would look into um, possibly lowering the cost of permits uh, to the general contractors to uh, induce more housing projects, and also make sure we had enough water, and if we didn't, find ways to make that act actable both so we would be able to supply the houses with proper water.
That's an excellent question, and one of my top priorities is about housing, so thanks for bringing that up. So right now, we have a lack of inventory in the mid-income housing market. A lot of people in Klamath County think that we have a low-income um, um, market that doesn't have the inventory, and that's actually not true. There's, most of our community can afford houses in that mid-range mid, uh, market, but we just don't have the housing, so instead of buying up, they're buying down and they're compressing the, the low-income housing market. So we've got to increase our inventory significantly in that middle range. It's going to help our tax rolls. It's going to get people into housing. It's going to help our community greatly. And it's also a critical piece of the infrastructure. So when we start looking at expanding our economy and trying to bring business here, they're going to want to know what does our housing market, our housing inventory look like, and we just don't have that market. So as commissioners, it is absolutely one of their priorities to do something to incentivize building in that mid-income market so we can really um, set ourselves up for growth and prosperity down the road, but we've got to focus on that, and that is one of my top priorities. Thanks for bringing that up. One of the key, pro one of the key things is having labor that can do it, and uh, community college is working on opening up an apprentice uh, uh, center for apprentice, uh, and I know Kate Brown has some money that's coming this direction probably for that. Uh, so the other problem is, is we, you know, our journeymen that are here that can train people are retiring, and, and they can only, by working long, only take on one or two at a time. So there is no way we can build the houses with our own people and train people. It's just going to take too long. We need, to, we need to bring in some outside developers, and I've been talking with some of the larger developers in, in America, uh, but some of the challenges they have is making a pencil here. Um, if they pick up a bunch of lots and they can't find the labor here locally, they got to bring somebody in or build a fourplex and then put their crew in it and then build from there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but if we offer some tax exemptions to bring in developers uh, from outside, we might, we might find a way forward. Other questions? Yeah, Marty. So I think one of the things that's broken about the political system in our country is what I call career politicians. Um, my question to you three is that would you commit to a limited amount of terms to serve? Uh, and if so, what would be that number? Dave, you get the first crack at this one, and Alan? One of the things I said, I've got a minute, man, I'm talking fast. One of the things I said at a, at a meeting was I'm not running to get reelected. And later, the person came up. A person came up and said, "What do you What do you mean by that?" And I said, "I'm, I'm running for an open seat. It's a two-year term, and, and it's time for us to shake some things up because I think that we lack political will in government. People are so interested in getting reelected and keeping their income that they're afraid to take risk. I don't need this income. I don't really need a new career. I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this so we can shake some things up at local government and try to get some things accomplished. And if you love what I'm doing in two years." Let's talk about re-election. If you don't like what I'm doing in two years, we shake hands and we part ways. But to answer more specifically your, your question, Marty, I want to fulfill this two years, and let's see where we are in two years. If things are going great, I might run again for you for four more, but then I'm going to tap out. Because I think, just like when I was the chief, I said chiefs have a shelf life, and I'm going to leave when I'm on top, not on the bottom, and I did six years, which is what my commitment to all of you was when I got hired. I did six and I was out. Todd? This is my first time being a public servant, so I'm going to be new at this. Uh, but, um, yeah, I've run two years. If you like what I did and I've really made a difference in two years, uh, I would run another four and get out. So. Good point with the uh, length of time I've been asked that, and I was asked that in the talk show this morning, too. Um, I would definitely try to put some type of legislation in at the county level um, to make it eight years maximum and then you have to move on. Um, career politicians uh, tend to have special interest groups that tag behind them. And that's something that uh, we all have seen throughout our lives. And we don't need that in Klamath County. And I do believe after 12 years of being here, uh, that's one thing that holds us back. And every two years I attend meetings like this all over the county. Funny thing is, the same problems seem to be brought up. So what does that mean? Somebody's not doing their job down there. So putting a cap on the length of time that one person runs is an absolute must. Eight years would be maximum. 
four years would be considered. Um, two years, not enough to get something done for the people. Thank you. Matt Early. Uh, kind of along those lines, you know, over the years, uh, we've looked at and voted on a charter form of government, and which I, I feel would be a great way to go where you have a county manager and maybe some part-time uh, commissioners. So I'd like to know what your thoughts are about the charter form of government. Todd, you can go first. I think we need to look at it, explore it. Uh, we're one of the only counties where there's just three commissioners, there's no general manager, so we kind of serve, from what I understand, as CEOs of the, all 26 different departments, 26 give or take, whatever it is. Um, so it is kind of a lean and mean thing, and I know our bylaws probably need to be updated because right now they state that we work one, one day a week. Um, and I know it's. I know our current commissioners are actually working more than that. But um, you know, it needs to be a full time full time job, and you should hold another job outside of that, probably. So um, that would be my take on it. Um, like Todd was saying, I couldn't believe that there hasn't been any time set from before Tom Millums, where uh, it was a volunteer position, and all that was required was one day according to what was the bylaws that were laid down. Uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, yes, five days a week, full-time job, uh, the people elect you, you work for them, you don't work for yourself. If you can squeeze in something else on the side, be my guest, some people do work two jobs, but don't neglect the people that put you there just for the love of money. And if it's not enough money, you need to find a new job, not working for the people. And from what I've seen, it pays quite enough. And coming out of retirement, I don't need the money. And that's why I'm giving half the salary back to the Klamath County people and charitable donations. Thank you. So I believe that county commissioners really need to be setting policy, setting direction, setting vision, thinking ahead 5, 10, 15 years, meeting with constituents, understanding what it is that the people want of the county, what the people want of government, and, and setting direction, but not being in the weeds with the day-to-day -day operations of the directors. I think that that's a, a position for a county manager, and that's what you're speaking to, Matt, and I, I support that 100%. I'm definitely interested in reevaluating and analyzing how that would look in Klamath County and if it's feasible and fits within our budget. It doesn't put an excessive um, tax strain on our community. Um, that I'm all for it. I think that we had that form of government when I worked in the city. We had a city manager. All of us department directors re reported to the city manager who reported to council. And I think that form of government works very well. It streamlines a lot of processes. And I think the county needs to take a serious look at doing that to uh, streamline our processes and be much more efficient. Tom Sheese. There's, uh, we've had several uh, county commissioners that have been here before uh, many times, and usually they generally talk about one thing, and that's funding. And I haven't heard any of you talk about any of your ideas for how you're going to save money or spend money or reallocate money to the departments, and I know a lot of departments are hurting on their budget, so if I could just get a couple ideas from each of you on how you should plan to, or uh, have better ideas than what we're currently dealing with. Alan and Dave. Well, from what I understand, there's quite a bit of infrastructure money and the millions of dollars that are coming down the pipeline. Um, how they're to be used, I can't tell you because I don't see the budget, and there's a lot more behind that. Uh, including solar included. Um, as far as um, dealing with the money, uh, grants, they've been working on grants and they've been, <laughs> appears to be doing a pretty good job uh, bringing in grant money, but then that has to be somewhat matched with taxpayer money. So that's not an uh, absolute solution to it. Um, the infrastructure money, uh, I'd like to see that go to places like you uh, were mentioning, to be able to build a better community for ourselves. And there's plenty of them. I saw the numbers and I was very amazed at how many millions of dollars are coming our direction. Thank you very much. 
So as you guys know, I was the police chief and I studied police allocation and allocation of staffing for a long time. The first two years that I was the chief here in Klamath, I actually held your budget flat. I didn't ask for an increase at all. Um, so one of the things that I would really like to do as, as the next county commissioner is take a look at how do we reallocate, reallocate uh, patrol deputies to increase um, uh, response time for the deputies to 24-7. Right now they're not working 24-7. So I have an idea on how we can get coverage 24-7 at the same time, um, uh, save some money. So I don't, I've only got a minute, I'm going to talk super fast. But right now, the city of Klamath Falls has a sergeant, five people working uh, within the urban growth boundary, so does the sheriff's office. So you have two supervisors and 10 cops covering 41,000 people. That's extreme overkill. Let's, let's contract that out to the city of Klamath Falls and push the deputies out into the rural community. Help them become resident deputies so all of these, all of these rural communities have law enforcement and it wouldn't be an increase, an increase of $3.3 million to the sheriff's office. Maybe it's only a million to the city to do it and you save two mil of your uh, road funds. I'll say, uh, if you feel like you've run out of time here, because I know a minute is a, is a very short time to respond, but, uh, Keep notes, we'll have some time to maybe wrap, wrap up stuff in your final comments, so. Go ahead, Tom. Well, one of the interesting things about this area that I discovered is that we've got the city of Altmont right in the middle of Klamath Falls, but we don't ever talk about the city of Altmont because it's just the unincorporated area. It pays a very low tax rate compared to the rest of us, and they don't have all the services that we do. Uh, the other thing we need to look at doing is, well, and there's one of the benefits of that is, and we don't tell people this, but, they, we, we, most of us qualify for FHA loans, especially the low income folks. That's one of the benefits because we're population size is small enough based on the statistics. So that's one of the things to tell your neighbors about. Um, the other thing is, is, is we need to look at how we reallocate our services to the outlying areas as well and make sure those taxpayers get services. So as far as raising money, there's grants. They come with strings attached sometimes and we do have a full-time grant writer now uh, at the county in Natalie, I believe. Um, and so uh, I think we're making some progress and we'll look forward to looking at those numbers and seeing what we can do to make it fair and keep the taxes coming, but not raise taxes if possible. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, are you, is there anything that the, uh, you guys can do about illegal marijuana growing, protecting, stopping them, and uh, especially from the perspective of water? So the question was, if people didn't hear it, was uh, is there anything to be done about the legal marijuana grows and the impact that's having in the community, especially the water? Uh, and I believe, Dave, you're, you're up first. So legal marijuana grows are decimating our rural community, as you guys know, and they're, they're literally stealing millions and billions of gallons of water from our aquifers. So I, I know the Sheriff's Office has written some grants to specifically target those illegal marijuana grows, and I think as county commissioners, we support those grants and we write letters to help with those grants to support that. Like I said, when I was your chief, I formed the community or the um, uh, Basin Interagency Narcotic Enforcement Team, which is made up of all agencies um, within the basin, including the DEA. Um, uh, um, the military was a part of that. And that is a regional task force that, that uh, takes on uh, drug enforcement activities throughout all of our region, and I will continue to support that. Even, even though that's housed at the Klamath Falls Police Department, the commissioners need to jump behind Binet as well, make sure that they have the staffing, the funding, and the resources they need to be able to go out and effectively um, target illegal marijuana grows. So there's a couple of ways that we can continue to um, go after illegal marijuana grows, and, and uh, that's something that's important to me as well, obviously, from law enforcement. Todd, you're next. I've encouraged our county commissioners to work with code enforcement to be tougher and meaner than all the rest of our surrounding uh, counties. When you find somebody $750 for a violation and wait 90 days for them to pay it, the crop's already done. Uh, I know the sheriff's going out earlier this year to some sites and just saying, hey, we're watching you spread plastic. Here's my card, we're watching what you're doing, and that's the proactive. So uh, work with, Chip, with Chris Cater on that. and. Um, encouraged him with that, but I'd like to see our code enforcement go up to like $10,000 uh, and then also educate our people not to lease their land to other people that they don't know unless there's a clause in there that states that if there's illegal activity on it, they're liable for it to protect their own citizens. So we need to educate our own citizens and, uh, and also maybe throw up some license plate scanners uh, out in the rural areas that watch those major, major waterways or driveways with the, where they haul water so we can pull over those tankers and find them. Because they're, if they're going four times a day, 
they're, they're not going to be hauling domestic water. Code enforcement definitely needs to become more involved. No question about that. I don't know what the ramifications would be, but uh, I try to definitely get uh, federal law enforcement involved. Um, code enforcement fines up, but at the same time, um, the sheriff was uh, speaking out of spray about increasing those, but what about the normal person that lives normally and has a code enforcement? A two-tier system, one for the drugs, one's for people that live peacefully. Um, to create a fine that's across the board, $10,000 for the commoner that has, has a hard time working and making a living is not fair. So to create a two-tier system to be able to bring more money and not hurt the locals at the same time. Um, I also <clears throat> talked to some people and went out to Sprague, uh, Beatty, and I guess Beatty has a problem where people are selling their water and illegally using it uh, to water crops. And at the same time, those people need to be identified and brought to justice. Thanks. So we've got one more question. Steve Bakke, you get it, and then we'll let you have closing remarks. What do you guys have an idea about all the blight in our community? If you take a drive down the Cray Lake Parkway, you'll see between Shasta Lake and the Truax Station, there's a building there, five buildings with four or five jumped out cars, garbage everywhere. I just want to know where you guys are coming Isn't that Bakke property? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, that's one of the things I noticed when I first came here to Climate Fall. There are a lot of junky places around here. And I've talked to some of the tow truck companies, and they're getting cars dropped off at night, and RVs in their parking lot, and or even, even at the junkyard, people are just dumping stuff, and they have to pay to get those vents taken care of. And so I think as a county, we need to help help those guys offset some of their costs for that cleanup. Uh, I know one of the OIT students is looking, put posted on Facebook if he wanted to go out and do it. I said, I'll join you. Let me know where and when I'll be out and help clean up some of these properties. But yes. Our, we need to help clean up these guys and get code enforcement. We don't have enough code enforcement going on right now. Uh, so that's one of the things we want to look at and make sure that all our inspectors and our, our county officials uh, do have actual the correct licenses and certifications to serve you. So those are some of my, some of my things that I'd like to get done. I've become proactive. I didn't like it across the street, so I volunteered my time, my trailer, my money and every Sunday to go out and help that lady clean her property up. So I didn't have to look at that. I know not everybody has that time to do that. Um, but to become more proactive and helping, um, I know the Elks Lodge, we have a team that went out and we would routinely help people out that needed to clean it up, that code enforcement is cited. And that was very successful. So being able to put teams together and the different community organizations to make this happen is vital and very important because most of these people would like to have it cleaned up, but they don't have the, the time, the ability, or the tools, or the apparatus to make it happen. So by putting something together like this where they have an opportunity to be able to participate with this, I find it vital in taking care of that particular problem. Thank you. Well, as you know, Steve, blight is an issue that, that I have as well. And I think it's important that when you're analyzing candidates or reviewing candidates or listening to candidates who want to be a commissioner, you ask yourself, what have they actually done, not what they say they're going to do? So let's talk about what have we actually done. When I was the chief of police, we had some grant programs in place, and we went out and talked with people about, hey, we can help, we can help subsidize some of the cleanup. We can help subsidize paint of your house, rebuild your fence. And a lot of people took advantage of that, specifically in the Mills neighborhood area. And we saw a ton of construction permits going up, and we completely revitalized that neighborhood um, with, with the strength and the passion of the, the neighbors as well. So there's some grant programs that we did that I would look at doing at the county level as well. I also kept money in the PD budget for demo. So if there was a house that did not have an owner at all, I would fork up some of the money and work with private businesses and private individuals to demo those houses and clean up those lots. I think that's really important. And third, one of the ideas I was talking to the new city manager about just the other day was, let's bring a contractor on and make him a city employee, and then let's rehab these houses ourselves and put them back on tax rolls. So there's a lot of things we can do. All right, well, Dave, you got the mic in your hand. 
Um, each of you can take one last minute and wrap things up. You can start leaving this path to Mike down. Okay, one minute. This is going to be super fast. Number one, I, I learned a long time ago to thank the people that got you there. So I'm going to put one whole minute into thanking all of you. When I became your police chief, you gave me a lot of grace. You gave me a lot of direction. You told me what you wanted from me, and, and you, you gave me the freedom to do that for you. So I respect that. I thank you for that. Because of those opportunities that I had as the police chief, those experiences I had through your graces and your guidance, I think it puts me in a really good position to carry on being a public servant as your next Klamath County Commissioner. So thank you for that. I really owe you a lot. Um, you made my last six years of my career just incredibly um, I'm incredibly proud of the last six years I had working with a lot of you in this room, so so thank you. Um, the last thing I want to leave you with before I pass the mic is I, I see my 15 second sign is going to come up right there. <laughs> Perfect timing in my head. This job is for you, this job is not for me. I encourage all of you to vote for somebody that's got a proven passion, a proven commitment, and a proven dedication to people. And that's Dave Hensley. So God bless you all. Thanks for being here. It's great to see you. Closing, I'd like to say I'm looking forward to working for you, and um, I assure you I'll fight racism, I'll fight government corruption as your public servant, and I'm not taking any money from anyone, and I'm free of all special interests. So I'm clean, and I look forward to working for you and representing you. Thank you. One of my priorities would definitely be voter integrity. After leaving um, the northern part of the county today, I looked at the voter boxes. No lights, no cameras, no nothing, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, definitely would address this and make sure that the security of our voting system is taken care of, like we take care of our money being take, taken to the bank and brinks trucks. That's our democracy at hand, and we need to protect that at all costs. Also, working with the Indians, and the farmers, going back to the 1906 water contract and seeing if something can be comprehensively put together to make all parties acceptable to it. Because ever since then, nobody seems to be able to come up with a solution. Um, that would be one of my main goals I'd work on. And people are first, and then the water farmers, and then the rest of it comes after. But without the water, we can't achieve anything, so we have to work together with the water to achieve that. Thank you for this opportunity to come and speak to you today, and God bless you all. Well, thanks again for your participation. Thanks for stepping up to, and be willing to serve our, our community. You know, one thing we forgot to do early on was uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Maybe it would be a good way to end the meeting right now. So, like, afternoon and your willingness to take on what I know is a, a very, very difficult uh, job and we wish all of you well in your campaign and, and in the election. So please let us pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are indeed living in unprecedented and challenging times. Each day brings new reminders of the serious challenges facing our everyday lives. As the world and our nation faces division and disagreement, grant each of us quiet, gentle hours, free from worry and strife. Every day, even the most difficult days, when we overcome life's challenges and find happiness and fulfillment in everyday living. May our hearts be truly grateful for all that we have, 
our families, our community, and our nation. Guide our stewardship as we share our blessings. May we demonstrate your love and share your grace. As we approach the upcoming elections, grant our nation's leaders the wisdom to discern what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, and give them the integrity and the moral fiber to govern America and fulfill its role in the world. Bless this meal and our body's needs to serve and serve others above self. God bless America.